Welcome to this first presentation for academic year 2023 of the Command and General Staff School and the Command and General Staff College Foundation's co-sponsored interagency brown bag lecture series. This is our seventh year of the series and the 46th presentation and the CGSC Foundation is proud to be part of the college's efforts to provide a forum for the discussion of topics that are of concern across all of government during this noontime period for the academic day. For those of you that I don't know, my name is Rod Cox. I'm with the Command and General Staff College. And on behalf of my partners, the CGSS Command and General Staff School, Colonel Tommy Cardoni and Mr. Marv Nichols, it's our pleasure to present this lecture series to enhance your interagency and all of government awareness and education. This lecture series is made possible by a grant from the Perot Foundation to our foundation. Now, before we start, I want to make you aware of a couple of other things that the foundation is doing, in fact, three in specific events that are being conducted to enhance the, the educational experience while you're here at Fort Leavenworth for the quality of life, not only for you and your families, but also to improve your education while you're here. There are flyers around the room, and I would ask you to take those with you there that are about the details of some things I'm going to talk about. Um, so first off, tomorrow evening, we have a wonderful opportunity tomorrow at 1730 at the Riverfront Community Center, which is in downtown Leavenworth. We've got uh, Dr. Harry Labor, who's a professor of the history department here, who's a renowned expert on Ulysses S. Grant. And he's going to present as part of our distinguished speaker series a discussion where he talks about the leadership development of Ulysses Grant. He's an expert, as I mentioned, and tickets are on sale available at the website there. And so I refer you to the flyer for that, or you can just show up and pay at the door. We'd love to see you there with us. A great opportunity to hear some good scholarship from one of the members of the faculty here. The second event I want to tell you about is on Sunday morning, October the 9th. Our foundation is partnering with the Greater Kansas City Friends of the Fisher House and will host a family-friendly event, which is going to be a 5K run and walk here on Fort Leavenworth. The proceeds are going to go to support military and veterans and their families. And I ask you to, once again, the flyer for that looks like this. Um, go there. I ask you to go there and register. All the entrants that participate will receive a T-shirt, and you'll be eligible to win prizes based off your categories of participation. This event is designed to be an event that is for you and your family, something that you can do together, um, or you can, uh, if you're a hardcore runner and you want to have a time, this will be a computer chip time run, so you can go out and actually run a race to record in your times, or you can, like I said, take a leisurely family activity and participate in the event. I also want to make a note that this will start and end at the Frontier Army Museum here on post, and part of the thing is, is to give the runners an opportunity to see some of the beautiful historic parts of our post. And finally, for those of you that are on the outstations mainly, but those that are here as well, you can participate virtually with our run if you'd like. You'll also see how to do that at the registration site, so I encourage you to go do that. The last event that I want to talk about is a bucket list opportunity that you can do while you're here this year at Fort Leavenworth, and that's on Friday evening, October 21st at the Kansas Speedway. Now, our foundation is partnered with the Kansas Speedway, and they're going to allow us to have a party down in the Victory Lane area of the inside infield of the track. You'll also be given the opportunity to do a bucket list opportunity, which is drive your own car around the NASCAR track, or you can ride in the um, pace car, the official pace car around the track as well. So once again, kind of a neat opportunity there, a family friendly event, individuals and families can come out and participate in that, and we'd love to see you there. Once again, go to our foundation website and register. Final admin note, our next brown bag is scheduled for Tuesday, November 15th, where the, the Department of State will be discussing relationships as far as the U.S. Department of State and things you might want to know for that. So we invite you to be there. 1230, same room, same time location. Encourage your friends to come out if they want a little more, more about the Department of State. Today's presentation will, in fact, be recorded for use by the distance learning and the DDE folks and the satellite campus people and the IA practitioners around the world, as well as being live streamed over the college's Blackboard system. So what that means to you, those in the room here, please be aware that the, this recording has taken place. And so if you engage in dialogue, have a question or a discussion point with, with our briefer, please talk so that you'll hear the microphones pick you up. You don't need to touch any of them. 
the the man in the booth will make sure that's the case. But be aware, we'd like for you to be picked up on the microphone so the recording and the outstations can hear your part of the discussion. Thank you all again for joining us. The ultimate high ground, space. As stated in our national security strategy, strategy, excuse me, the U.S. must maintain leadership and freedom of action in space. In addition to our ever-increasing dependence on space-based systems and information, other governments and private sector organizations are continuing to increase their own actions in and influencing the domain. Our presenter today will discuss current and future space initiatives, as well as some of the many government agencies invested in space operations. Mr. Thomas Gray serves as the U.S. Army's Space and Missile Defense Command's liaison officer to the U.S. Army's Combined Arms Center and Army University. He has responsibility for the integration of space knowledge and education across various TRADOC, Joint, and other service schools to include the U.S. Army's Command and General Staff College. A retired U.S. Army officer, Mr. Gray is a Level 3 space professional of the U.S. Army's Civilian Space Cadre. He holds Space Operations Assignment Officer Designation 3 Yankee and has earned the U.S. Army's Master Space Badge. Mr. Gray holds a bachelor's from New Hampshire College and earned a master's from Central Michigan University. Please welcome Mr. Thomas Gray. Thank you, Mr. Cox. I appreciate that. Uh, good morning, everybody. It's a pleasure to see you. Thank you for being here. Um, kind of interesting where I'd like to go today is, is we look at the Department of Defense and space operations and how critical it is to that. But when we start thinking about space and its criticality to national security, we also have to understand is who are the agencies that do business within the de for the government to put forth the nation's wills. And there are a lot of them. But then you have to stop and think, which of these agencies actually depend upon a space capability? And the bottom line up front, every one of them, because it underpins our national security. Today, I, I could probably spend a good eight hours talking about every agency and its dependencies on space-based capabilities. But what I would rather do is just basically focus on a certain few who have a primacy in space as it relates to our nation and its security and we in the Department of Defense, how we do the whole of government approach with agencies in the domain of space and its criticality. Uh, I want to start with just a little bit of history before I go into these uh, departments, but what are our dependencies when we think about those as a nation? We could start with telecommunications, the ability to communicate not only within our nation, but also internationally, the understanding of news, of what's going on in the world. Uh, today's today's uh, understanding of, for example, the Ukrainian-Russian conflict and what's going on in that part of the world and how that is going to affect the rest of the world, Europe, uh, the recession, the, the inflation, the energy crisis that's going to be coming and how that's going to affect what we're going to do. Our ability to even just use a cell phone is critical is critical reliance on space-based capabilities, especially when you think about common timing protocol, the ability to have those things synchronized. When we look at navigation and timing, global finance works on the GPS system. It doesn't work on anybody else's timing protocols. It works on GPS. So if you're going to do some sort of stock transaction, if you're going to do some sort of economic work if you're just going to walk up to McDonald's, slide your credit card and say, I want a Happy Meal, that's got, that is reliant on GPS timing. And then the ability for us to be able to navigate and, and, and to be able to know where we are in a world for the transportation, the trucking industry, the airline industry, shipping, global shipping. Most of the world relies more on GPS than they do anybody else's system. As we look at the threats in the world, we understand as we've been watching 
Ukraine and Russia. We see the Russia's way of war prosecuting fires with maneuver and, and watching the implication of new hypersonics. What's, what are we doing with we watch North Korea with the building of nuclear capability. If we look at Iran with, with prosecuting missile warfare and, and how we just saw the recent exercises by China in the South China Sea with the missiles that they were firing from the mainland and from their ships. How do you know when and how can you protect yourself as we leave a very l low level conflict in, in counter insurgency operations and now go to large scale combat across multiple domains against peer or near peer competitors. That gets to be very important, especially when we start thinking homeland security as North Korea develops intercontinental ballistic missile capability. And can I trust them as much as I can trust Russia, China, not to initiate long, long range uh, intercontinental ballistic nuclear warfare? I don't know. How do I know that's going to happen? What's the intelligence I'm seeing? Uh, how do I have ears? How do I have eyes in areas of denial from airspace? Because if you look at air over a nation, it's sovereign. It belongs to them. I have to have permission to fly in their airspace. We see that historically. Just ask Gary Powers how important that is. And so our ability to see first, to be able to take away some of, of the, the nebulous areas we don't know over parts of the country and parts of the world that we don't have access to. And so that's, the space allows us that capability. As we are watching what's happening in the Ukraine with Russia, what's happening down Venezuela, what's happening in China, what's happening in the South China Sea. We have the ability to have an understanding ahead of time in order to be able to support our nation and where it's going. And then I, personally, I am an obsessed motorcyclist. The first thing I do every morning, the last thing I do every day is I look at the weather. Doesn't mean I'm not going to ride, but I know what I'm going to wear. And so when we start thinking about the criticality of climate change, what's happening in the world, how is that going to affect our policies and where we are as a nation? Uh, today, you can look at the Department of Defense priorities, and one of the very important things they're looking at is climate change and what the rising seas are going to do to our ports for the Navy, how that the uh, big storms are going to affect our ability to and, and our security of our uh, military infrastructure. When you look at, for example, Homestead Air Force Base and what happened when the hurricane came through there, and we had the warning ahead of time based upon satellite imagery to watch those hurricanes come all the way across the ocean and to be able to then protect by leave, having aircraft leave those airfields so they, they, they do not get damaged. We're watching it even today with Hurricane Fiona, having gone through Puerto Rico, then hitting the Dominican Republic, and then now moving up and headed towards Bermuda, the advanced warning in order to be able to protect our infrastructure. So when you look at the basis of our national security, what agencies are involved in these kind of operations for our country, because it's just not the Department of Defense, but it's everybody in order to do the, the capabilities we need as a nation. Historically, historically, when you look at space, it really starts back in World War II when you start seeing rocket technology. But when you get into actually getting into space, Russia with Sputnik being first into space, and then the Soviet Union with Sputnik 2, the first animal in space. Uh, we finally follow up three months later with Explorer 1 in space. So now you have the two world superpowers having satellites orbiting in space. Uh, first man goes into space with Yuri Gagarin from, from the Soviet Union. Uh, Alan Shepard follows not that long after with going 
into space, not orbiting. The orbiting piece follows later with John Glenn, actually going around the Earth in a space capsule. Uh, we see uh, the Soviet Union follows with a woman in space. We see the Soviet Union follow with the first space walk. Uh, you see the first space station, and then when you look at the power play that happens between the United States and the Soviet Union, we see the United States basically, quote unquote, air quotes, wins the space race by putting the first man on the moon. And so that's some pretty, pretty impressive things going on, but then you say, okay, who plays in that? Who are the pieces that make all of that happen? Why is space so important? And so one of the things we look at is today, with today's space policy, we recognize that space underpins our national security. Who should be involved in that? What agency? Who's in charge of that? And I would tell you, when you look at interagency operations, it's every one of them. It's all the way from our intelligence community, all the way to our science and exploration, all the way to our Department of Defense. The geological survey, farming, agriculture, transportation, space touches everything we do. Uh, and, and even more so now, how fast and how big the commercial sector is growing in space. And what are the economic implications of that for us as a nation? Because that's a lot of power that gets played through economics. So when you start thinking about where we are today, who plays in space? We here at the Command and General Staff College focus on Department of Defense. What are the defense implications and how are we using satellite and space technology to prosecute warfare? But we also think how it really started, even though it was a competitive domain, how it really started was in the science and exploration of going to the moon. And so with that, when you ask a typical civilian who's in charge of space, they will say NASA. NASA is. You ask somebody in the military, they'll tell you U.S. Spacecom. Different perspectives. But what you have interagency is you have a memorandum of agreement between U.S. Spacecom, Department of Defense, and NASA as we now look at the Artemis program and we're going back to the moon. We see a lot of folks talking about going back to the moon and space exploration. South Korea has just got, had a satellite launch and it is going to orbit the moon because they're trying to see what's going on on that part of the moon. China is, is looking at establishing a human base on the moon, on the southern pole, perhaps in concert with Russia. Our Artemis program is doing the same. So if you're looking at great power competition, and you have China and you have Russia both saying we're going back to the moon, can the United States sit back and say, well, we'll just let you go do that? In this case, it's, we have to think about what are the implications for our nation as we go forward and looking at going even further to Mars. And you've already seen China's already been on Mars, as we have. So you start seeing the collaboration that's going on between the United States and the Department of Defense, the collaboration for the cislunar security we're not just looking at low Earth orbit. We're not just looking at geosynchronous. We're going all the way out to the moon, as is NASA. And so we, as an interagency play, who is doing what to whom where, and how, how are we looking at this from a strategic perspective on national security? And who are the other agencies looking at that as well? So understanding the science, technology, education, and, and, and engineering, and math that needs to be involved in this, the Department of Education is working really hard right now to look at how do we, as a nation, educate our populace in order to be able to support the scientific promotion of our nation in order to be able to 
effectively run these kind of operations. So NASA, the big science exploration, go out and look at the, look at the, the universe as it is. I would imagine many of you have probably already been online and look at the images from the James Webb Telescope and all the things that are happening with that. Looking back 15 billion years of time as, as we're looking at galaxies that so far away, looking back in time, that's pretty exciting. Um, for, for us, looking from space, to here. The ability to then have the intelligence to look at our national security. So there is this organization called the National Reconnaissance Office. Up until 1992, I couldn't even say National Reconnaissance Office. It was such a classified program. And today they have a gift shop. You can go there and you can buy their jacket. It's pretty cool. But what they do is they do the, the the acquisition, the design, the build, and the operation of our technical satellites that allow us to listen from space and see from space in several areas that are denied that give us the advantage to not be surprised. And so we as a nation want to be able to see what's going on, hear what's going on within the realm of the South China Sea. Uh, within the realm of um, the Ukraine and Russia and those things that are happening now. And so one of the things that they're doing that's very interesting is, is NASA is partnering with the commercial industry now, getting, looking at what the innovations they're doing and getting into CubeSat technology. So now instead of a satellite that's the size of a Greyhound bus, now you're talking about satellites that are the size of a microwave still doing the same kind of job that we're looking for, only less ubiquitous and, and more responsive. Wherein before we would only launch through DOD for intelligence satellites like the NRO, we're now launching them from New Zealand. We're now launch, looking at launching on commercial capability. It's a very, very uh, innovative and now taking those commercial capabilities and instead of doing it through the National Geospatial Intelligence Agency, the NRO will start looking at the management of integration of commercial imagery in order to be able to prosecute those kind of things we're doing. So not only DOD, but intelligence community, the scientific community, and then when you really think about space, and what is the importance interagency is what, what are the economic advantages that space brings to us as a nation? And that is really comes down through the Department of Commerce. You say, really? Department of Commerce? And they do have an office of space, which is really interesting because SpaceX is a commercial company. Origin, commercial company. Planet, LLC, commercial company. Uh, Pick any number of them. Sirius XM, commercial company. Uh, and so when you start talking, Dish TV. So how much money plays in space? Who's regulating that? Who's looking at that? How, how does that play when you talk business and government? Who's regulating that? How does that play? One of the other things we're seeing when you talk about uh, interagency work, currently, it is the Department of Defense who is responsible for the domain awareness. Who's up there? Where's the satellite? When's the satellite? There are radars, there are telescopes, there are satellites in space looking at satellites in space. And so who's, who's managing that? Who is the Federal Aviation Administration of space? I mean, we have them to do planes. Well, currently, it's the Department of Defense. Is that really the best answer when you start thinking about, for example, let's say China has a satellite and it is in orbit and it is going to come in the path of another satellite. If the Department of Defense calls China and says, hey, your, your satellite is going to be in, in danger because it's going to collide with another satellite, can China trust the Department of Defense? 
Are we telling them that because it's truth or are we telling them that because we want them to have less access to their satellite or to move their satellite to our advantage? That becomes an issue. So the discussion going on right now is the Department of Defense, uh, pardon me, the Department of Commerce is going to take over the space domain awareness for the commercial world in order to be able to be the federal aviation of space to provide those kind of analysis. Now, it would be the Department of Defense still providing the data, but now it comes under the Department of Commerce to be able to do the warning and the, the information share across the globe. It becomes commerce versus defense. Money talks, and there's a lot of money that plays in space, and so the Department of Commerce Office of Space Operations is growing tremendously because of how much commercial space is happening. So this is government agency supporting our economic growth in what they do. Now, within the Department of Commerce, we also have the National Oceanographic Atmospheric Administration, the weather. These folks actually command and operate all of the weather satellites, theirs and sat weather satellites for other folks. For example, they actually command the Department of Defense meteorological satellite program. Used to be the Air Force commanded those satellites, now it's, it's NOAA. And so the, you, we're trying to consolidate operations. So when the military say, I need this data for the weather over this part of the world, it, though you get the direct downlink, it's still NOAA that's commanding the satellites. They're also commanding satellites, environmental monitoring type satellites for NASA, for France, because it's a consortium, uh, and, and also for the U.S. Space Force when you're talking about a geosynchronous satellite that we have moved over the Pacific, Pacific area of the world. So to understand and predict what's happening, the environmental monitoring, what's going on with climate change, what's happening to the glaciers, how is, how is that going to affect our ability as a nation? How, what's that mean to us? How do we do disaster response? How do we bring that in with FEMA? How do we do that with Homeland Security? So when you start thinking of this, what agency does not play in space? And, and so it's huge. Recently, as, as in 2019, we established the Space Development Agency. This is a Department of Defense agency. However, their mission is to look at who is the threat in the world, how can we have a short access to support that priorities framework that says the nation's linchpin for our security is in the domain of space, and how are we protecting it, how are we using it to our advantage, and so what we're seeing is this, the development agency is looking at the warfighter and the threat, and how can we quickly bring together a, an answer for us to be able to use space in order to be able to protect our national security. For example, we saw not long ago China do a anti-satellite destruction of one of their own satellites. We saw Russia do the same to theirs. We saw India do the same to theirs. We saw the United States do the same to theirs. And so if satellites are such an easy target and they are big, one of a kind, how do you protect your, asset, your access to space? Well, instead of having one big satellite disaggregated into a constellation of lots of little satellites, we see that today with Starlink, with what uh, Elon Musk has done, or what Bezos has done with OneWeb, or any number of constellations of satellites. Uh, for example, even back last century, Motorola established Iridium satellites, which is a constellation of low Earth orbiting satellites to provide telecommunications. And so today, we're watching the Space Development Agency, brand new, 
start working how do we disaggregate satellites and provide assured access for our nation to space capabilities for our security. I'd love to be able to do this with every agency up there because every one of them, U.S. Geological Survey, United States uh, internal for internal agency for internal development, Department of State, I mean pick pick an agency. This is a brown bag lecture for interagency discussion. Every agency uses a space capability. Several agencies have the responsibility to, to do space operations as their primary. Commerce, Space Development Agency, NASA, NOAA, DOD. And so with that understanding, the linchpin for our nation as, as articulated by this administration, the previous administration, the administration before that, we recognize this is why we have developed the U.S. Space Force, why we have reinstituted the United States Space Command, and why every agency has some sort of piece that relies on a space capability. Pursuant to your questions, this is interagency, which is really interesting because I'm an Army guy. You got to wonder why am I talking interagency? Because everything we do, everything we do is whole of government approach to achieve our national security. So thank you for, for your time, uh, and I am certainly happy to uh, entertain any questions you might have. Sir. Yeah, my question first then. Uh, so you mentioned with NOAA being kind of a national consortium. What other uh, interagencies or national consortiums ex exist out there? Um, or agreements, you know, uh, a, a, as such that are looking to further our U.S. national interests? Yeah. Th uh, the biggest thing that's happening right now are the Artemis Accords that are happening internationally. And so the Artemis Accords is, is one, one of the things there is we need to stop doing uh, direct ascent destruction of satellite testing. And so the United States has started with that. We've had two other countries that have brought in on that. And we're starting to see a lot more growth on that. Uh, there's been discussion that perhaps we need a new outer space treaty uh, because of so much advent of commercial. How do we do that? Uh, s several nations have already kind of pushed that off because one is that they're saying, well, it really isn't broken, so why do we need to fix it? But then they say there's not enough fidelity. And so a lot of nations are saying that's probably what we really like. We don't want the fidelity because that gives us a lot of wiggle room to be able to do what we need to do, but also not restrict ourselves or each other. Uh, other things that happen interagency-wise, um, the biggest piece is what we're seeing in the intelligence community. And uh, we've just seen the stand-up of our 18th IC, which is the National Space Intelligence Center, that used to be part of the National uh, Air and Space, NASIC, National Air and Space Intelligence Center, but they took the piece that works on space threat and space counter space threat, pulled those out, and they now belong. Basically, the NSC is part working as, as uh, Delta 18 of the United States Space Force. Uh, and so a lot of that kind of piece, piece runs together. Um, you take, for example, Department of State. If we want to establish a location in another country, uh, when we were building the mobile user objective system, communication system, and we needed command and control facilities on the ground, one of those was in Siganella, Italy. Have to get Department of State to go in first to uh, work those diplomatic pieces that says, well, we really need to have this kind of command and control, big antennas, line of sight, access, and we really need that. So, so that the, the agency integration 
to be able to do that kind of thing is, is, is works pretty good. Does that help answer the question, sir? Okay, great. Anybody else? Oh, yes, sir. Please come to a, to a microphone so the people on the outstations can hear you. No, it's on the table. So not being an expert uh, in space issues, I had been to the moon just a couple of times. That's all. Um, so the question relates to how competitive U.S. space capabilities compared to Russian and Chinese. For example, I would assume that uh, we might, I don't know, but we might uh, be willing to support our Ukrainian partners with intelligence monitoring the movement of uh, Russian military capabilities through the Kerch uh, bridge from the Russian proper to the uh, Crimean Peninsula. So I am sh I'm sure Russia might understand that can they block this monitoring and passing intelligence to the Ukrainians? By the same token, let's say we want to help our Taiwan partners uh, by monitoring, through monitoring in the South China Sea, can uh, Chinese block this monitoring and prevent this, uh, keep, you know, the, the intelligence being passed to, to, uh, to, to Taiwanese? Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you. That's a, that's a real good question because how secure are our space capabilities and our ability to support our international partners? Uh, and so uh, Russia and China, uh, space capabilities. Russia, Russia was really the, the, the bellwether that was the, the, the benchmark that we were working through, through the 50s and 60s into the 70s. They were really the benchmark that we, we were, we were uh, measuring against. Um, once, once we got to the moon, uh, you actually saw the technology of, of uh, American space actually leapfrog. Uh, Rus Russian, the way, this is a personal opinion, so this is not official, but in my observation, Russia does a real good job. When they find something that works, man, they stick with it, and it's good. Americans, we find something that works, and we say, I can make it better. Let me tweak it. I can do this better. I mean, how many, iPhone, how many new versions of iPhone can you get? I mean, the thing works. No, no, we're going to make it better. Okay, Russia, I have a rocket engine. It works really well. I'm just going to keep making that rocket engine. Matter of fact, the United States likes buying their rocket engines because they are very good, and they have been for years and years and years. Um, you take their satellite technology, uh, their advancements on satellite technology. We went very quickly to digital ISR. They stayed for many years with wet film ISR. Wet film pictures, we get digital pictures. So they had to keep launching and keep launching more and more satellites in order to be able to get the pictures. Because once the film is out in the camera, you can't go up and reload the camera. You have to send up a new camera. Um, so over time, once, once the, we saw that the Cold War ended and the wall came down, Russia really s did not stay intense on development except for launch and the International Space Station. And so their capabilities, uh, I don't want to say languished, but they did not advance any further. So, so Russia has really not been a, an advancing competitor in the realm of space. China, on the other hand, has grown exponentially quick. We, our initial thought processes with, with the growth of China and its timing would probably take them until easily 2045, 2050 to come close to where we are. I would tell you today, they're probably only about three years behind us now. They are very fast, they're very good, and, and in some cases, in a few cases, they're actually better than us in some aspects. So as a peer competitor, the benchmark is now China, and where, where we see competition 
and, and, and uh, the contested state, it's more in the realm of China. Now, the ability for them to also then now engage and maybe deny us capabilities. Uh, we see in the world today, uh, Russia, China, even North Korea, Iran, have an extensive electronic warfare capability. The interesting thing about space capabilities is everything down here that works on a satellite up here is through the electromagnetic spectrum. And so I don't believe the necessity, if we are going to provide support to the Ukraine, to Taiwan, can they deny us? The answer to that is absolutely yes, because they can deny and block the electromagnetic spectrum. They, they can cut off the link, whether it's the uplink or the downlink, to do that. However, in our support of the Ukraine, Taiwan, or any other ally in an operation, we have to look at how are they getting that support, where are they getting that support, do they necessarily need to get that from me? Can they buy it from a, an Italian synthetic aperture radar? Can they get it from a, uh, oh, I don't know, a Chinese commercial satellite, a European commercial satellite? So it's not just us, because in the world currently there are 78 countries that have a satellite capability in space. And so, yes, it's us. But the ability to just block us and deny us all the time, no. It will still get through at some point. Will there be times and moments of denial? Yes. Do they have the ability to do that? Yes. Do they have the will to do that? Because we have already stated in our, in our policy and in our strategy, an attack on our space capabilities is an attack on our national sovereignty. And so there, therefore, we reserve the right to respond at the time and place and manner of our choosing. So the question is, is how far do they want to go to engage our systems? Are they willing to pay the cost that may be associated with that? So this being the Command and General Staff College, the answer to your question is, it depends. What do you, did you mean by that? It means if, if they attack a satellite, are they willing for us to, to take the cost of our coming in and destroying a port, dest uh, major economic sanctions, respond in kind, I mean, whatever. Are they willing to, de to, are they willing to escalate that? Thank you. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Yeah, Tom, you've discussed uh, national defense organizations and their play, particularly in the security arena in space. What's the impact, in particular in the security arena, but in maybe in general, the commercial sector? That's a, you know, that's, the commercial sector impact in the world is very interesting right now, especially, I mean, this is in discussion in, in, in all the news media as it is, because how did, how did Ukraine get a lot of its imagery to prosecute? Well, they're getting, how are they getting their communications? I'll take the communication side right now because Russia was very effective in denying Ukraine its ability to communicate and conduct operations. How was it solved? Well, a commercial company came by the name of SpaceX came in with a system called Starlink. Russia, really good on electronic warfare, denying them. The trouble is, is Starlink is outside of their realm of electronic attack. Uh, can they cyber? Yes, but then it gets very, commercial is very agile. They're able to fix it really fast. Uh, a lot of folks don't understand is they thought uh, SpaceX just donated this time and these terminals to the Ukraine in order to be able to do their job. No, uh, it was provided, here you go, here's an interagency piece for you. It was provided by USAID, who will be here in a future time to talk about that. And so it is an interagency thing, it's a defense, it's an international, but it's provided by USAID. Now the question comes, has 
has SpaceX now identified themselves as a combatant? And are they a legal target? That gets very interesting because I can go all the way back to World War I and the Lusitania. I mean, it's a commercial entity. You can go to merchant shipping. They're commercial entities, but they're supporting a wartime effort. Are they legal targets? That I will leave to the realm of the lawyers and, 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 the, and the folks who want to be able to address that. But yes, the commercial capabilities are huge. We use a ton of it in order to be able to support our operations. Uh, is it a legal target? Maybe. What does the law of armed conflict say? If you decide to, you know, if you're a mercenary, you're now a legal target, and, but you don't get all the legal um, protection by the nation because you're a hired mercenary. So will the commercial entities have the legal protection of the nation in space? That's a real good question that I don't have the answer to. To follow up to that, Dan, given that state of play, do you see a larger percentage of the U.S. government or other allied nations' governments being in the commercial arena as opposed to government investment? Uh, will we use more commercial than we will invest in our own? We are seeing that today. Congress, Congress has even stated several times, it hasn't happened yet, but they've stated several times, why do we even have a National Reconnaissance Office? We can get great commercial imagery all over the place. We can use that. Why not? Uh, if you go back in history, uh, Operation uh, um, Iraqi Freedom, op in, in Operation Enduring Freedom, 86% of the satellite communications we used was commercial. We were, we were renting it. If you were doing operations down in Africa, we were renting commercial communications from a Chinese commercial company off a Chinese satellite in order to be able to do our communications. So my opinion is, is that I think we're going to see a heck of a lot more commercial entities because I can lease it, and when the operation's over, I'm, I'm done, and I don't have to have all of that infrastructure and investment and then all the maintenance costs that goes with it. So I think you're going to see continue to see a combination of military and commercial, and I think, I think it's the integration of that, it's here to stay. Absolutely. Um, I think we're coming to the end, end of the time here, so I, I want Is there one last question? Yes, sir. Let me get on this. I'll make this the yeah. last question. So just, just one question. Yeah. And this is specifically regarding, I guess, air and missile defense. I know that sure. um, it might be limited in your answer uh, for classification reasons. But I'm just curious at the potential uh, relationship between the National Reconnaissance Office, the Space Development Agency, regarding air and missile defense structure, and then that Link 16 network that you know has existed for legacy. Uh, but as we look at air and missile threats and how these agencies work together, um, you know, hypersonics have come on the scene as early as 2017, 2018. Uh, we're still talking about ways to, you know, interact and, and deal with that threat from various platforms, whether they be uh, in atmosphere or exospheric. Uh, but I guess if you could just touch on the relationship between those agencies and air missile defense community a little bit more. Absolutely. Happy to do that. Um, I will tell you that, uh, believe it or not, it's really not an NRO issue. Okay. It is an SDA issue. It's also, um, though you will find, it's, it's really a um, NORTHCOM, NORAD, uh, SPACECOM, STRATCOM, uh, Army Space and Missile Defense Command and the SDA all tying in together. There's a consortium going on right now between the Missile Defense Agency, the U.S. Space Force uh, uh, Space Systems Command, and, uh, and the Space Development Agency. All right, so those three agencies are now coming together to say how are we going to address the threat get this defense threat uh, architecture. One of the things the SDA is doing right now 
is developing this thing called the Tracking Indications and Warnings Target Advancement for Missile Threats. The very first satellites of that are going up at the end of this year. And so we're actually going to do an integration of the geosynchronous space-based infrared system, the old defense support program, the, the highly elliptical SIBR systems, and then they're putting up the first tranche of this tracking piece, which will then be also tied in with the transport layer that's going up right now. So we are going to have a, uh, another orbital domain closer than that that is way out geosynchronous so we can actually track those things. So what is happening is that between those agencies, we're pulling that together right now. Perfect. So at this time, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity to be here. I appreciate you coming here for the outlying stations. If there are any questions, send them to Rod. Other than that, I turn it over to you, sir. Thanks, Tom. Thank you, sir. Once again, thank you all for joining with us today. Next presentation of the Brown Bag, 15 November, same time, same location. We hope to see you then and hear about the State Department. Thank you.